Hello, I'm John Bachman. Welcome to Newsmax TV. Right now we're talking to Bill Bradley, one of the nation's most respected Democrats who served three terms in the United States Senate representing New Jersey. He's also a former presidential candidate and played basketball in the NBA and at the Olympics. He now works as a financial and investment advisor. His new book is called We Can All Do Better. It's great to have you with us, Senator Bradley. Thanks. Great to be with you. Well, the French socialist won the presidency Sunday. This appears to be a direct slap at the Germans and the British for calling for fiscal restraint and austerity. How do you read the results? Well, I read the results that uh, Sarkozy lost and Allen won, and I think the dynamic was not because of any foreign country. I think the dynamic was that uh, Holland ran a better campaign and Sarkozy hadn't delivered. Um, I think that hopefully Holland will uh, keep in mind Mitterrand, and Mitterrand went way left when he came in, and then he pulled back and stayed in the center, and that's where I hope Holland will be. Mitterrand was the, was the last socialist president of France, is that correct? Okay. Well, do you think this has any bearing or maybe indicative of anything uh, as far as voter sentiment here in the United States? Uh, no, I don't think you can uh, extrapolate from an election in France to an election in the United States. I think it has absolutely no significance. If, on the other hand, the euro crashed, I think that would feed back into the United States in terms of worsening unemployment. Well, unemployment is definitely a parallel. It's high uh, in Europe as well as here in the United States, and it apparently was a big issue in the French election. Now, here in the U.S., we have structural unemployment at about 14 percent or more. Uh, you provide some pretty straightforward ideas that you say will help create jobs, uh, like the federal government providing 30 percent of the cost for hiring new workers. You say this would create a minimum of 7 million new jobs. Have you pitched this idea to anyone on Capitol Hill, and if so, has anyone been receptive? Uh, yes, I have pitched it to any number of people, and no, they have not been receptive. <laughs> and what do you think their resistance to your plan is? Uh, I don't know. It uh, might be a little bit not invented here. Uh, at the same time, I think that uh, people got so fixed on uh, reducing Social Security taxes to stimulate the economy that they forgot that the public uh, won't even know that the, any jobs were created by a Social Security cut. My view with this proposal is that not one dollar of federal money would be spent that didn't create a job, and that's a net new job. Uh, individuals, you know, a company would hire someone and not fire anyone, and 30 percent up to $25,000 would be paid for by the federal government for two years. It would be a $50 billion program. And um, first come, first serve. And the result would be, as you said, unemployment dropping dramatically. You know, it certainly uh, is an interesting proposal. Let's talk about some of the other ideas out there. People like Paul Krugman uh, and others have argued that we haven't had enough stimulus, but we've pumped trillions of dollars into the economy since 2008. Uh, do you agree we need more fiscal restraint or more Keynesian stimulus? Um, I think we need both. I think that the original stimulus wasn't big, en big, big enough. As I point out, uh, if we had done what China did, which was 15 percent of their GDP, we would have had a stimulus of $1.9 trillion. But uh, we had 787. That got us through 09 and 10 and a little bit into 11, but it, it's gone now. And the issue isn't uh, stimulus in a cyclical sense. The issue is how do we generate long-term, good-paying jobs? And I think that there are a couple of things to consider. One is that uh, corporations, non-financial corporations, have $1.8 trillion on their books in either cash or other liquid assets. And the question is, how do you get them to spend part of that money on creating jobs in this country? And I suggest that there are a number of things that we have to do. One is uh, to address the confidence level. We simply have to get agreement in November on uh, a 3 to $4 trillion deficit reduction package. And my hope is that that package would not uh, take effect, or in other words, you wouldn't have big cuts for the next two years, but they would be structural changes in entitlement programs and defense programs and taxes that would uh, – lend long-term deficit reduction. Uh, but deficit reduction isn't enough in our current environment. I mean, you know, there, there are 66 million people in America living just uh, one paycheck away from economic crisis. And the income levels, the median income level in America in 2010, 
is the same as what it was in 1996. So the vast middle class has not moved forward. And the reason corporations don't hire is they say there's no demand. So you have to generate demand. And that's where I suggest that we really embark on a massive infrastructure effort that would have 50 high-priority items on it, like high-speed rail from Boston to Washington, from Seattle to San Diego, or at least San Francisco to San Diego, and a few others like a new air traffic control system, all of which would be the economic foundation for growth in America for the next 50 years, and that we ask the Chinese to help finance that. And if we've done the deficit reduction, the Chinese now give us $1.4 trillion. If we now give do the deficit reduction, then the Chinese will still have dollars. They could be the anchor investor in such an infrastructure fund and in the process lay the groundwork for economic growth and transform the relationships between the two countries. So I think those are two things that you need. You need to have the immediate job thing. As I described, you need to have deficit reduction. You need to have a massive infrastructure program that will create uh, 5 million jobs. And then you might get some of the money out of uh, the uh, um, the corporate treasuries. If, if the corporations spent 20% of their $1.8 trillion on hiring people, that would result in an unemployment rate of 5%. Well, let me ask you how your uh, 3 or $4 trillion deficit reduction plan would be different than, let's say, the Super Committee or the Simpson-Bowles plan, which really haven't gotten any traction. Um, I don't think there would be, you know, <laughs> deficit reduction is a little bit like uh, the walls and ceiling. There, When you're in a room, it has four walls, a ceiling, and a floor. That's the same it is with deficit reduction. You're not going to be able to get any unless you hit... Uh, uh, defense, Social Security, um, health care, and taxes. And so it would have to embody uh, some of each if you were going to get to the, to the right total. And I think that the, the point here is that both the, uh, the committee and also the Bowles Commission, Simpson-Bowles Commission, gave us a pretty good picture, and uh, Speaker Baynard and Obama broadly agreed on something similar last summer, summer of 11 only to find the 43 Tea Party people uh, rejected and Boehner have to pull back. So it, this is very clearly what's in our interest and in our long-term interest. And I believe that uh, we have to have people who who, are, who see that. I mean, and in the absence of that, you're going to have continued polarizations and paralysis while the situation gets worse and worse in terms of middle-class families, in terms of investors looking at the long-term deficit, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, sometimes in American politics, points of view have been irreconcilable right before the Civil War comes to mind. But usually it is decided uh, through vicious political combat that is bloodless but can be vicious. And what happens then, either one side win deci wins decisively and therefore can enact their program, or there has to be bipartisanship, like the years that I was in the Senate, for example. We did a lot of things with bipartisanship. But if neither the bipartisanship or the uh, dominant victory take place, then that opens the way potentially for a third congressional party to enter the picture that is kind of the can-do party. And it is the party that lays out the tough positions on the issues that we've been talking about. And if it wins uh, 20, 25 seats, uh, it then can be at the fulcrum of power in the Congress and maybe jar each of the parties to, um, to take on their sacred cows and deal with the issues. Well, it'd certainly be interesting to see something like that happen since the system really isn't set up for anything like that. Let's talk about your book a little more. Uh, in, in We Can All Do Better, you talk about the financial meltdown and the negative influence of money in politics. Do you feel like the Dodd-Frank bill reformed the system uh, to protect investors and consumers? No, I don't. I think it made marginal changes, but it didn't fundamentally change the system. Um, there's still uh, too much uh, possible for banks to use uh, depositors' money to speculate. Uh, there's too much leverage in the system. Uh, there is too much uh, lack of uh, regulation of derivatives. All these things are still out there. And, uh, you know, unless they're addressed, we could have another meltdown. You know, a really good bank will be able to survive. But how many really good banks had guessed right on everything were there? 
this is not a, a judgment about a really good bank. It's a judgment about the structure of things that encourage people who are less responsible to speculate with other people's money and then have the taxpayers end up picking it up. Well, you also write in your book uh, that much of the financial sector seems unable to decide, and I'm quoting you here, whether it wants to help build a new world or suck the life out of the, de the declining one. Um, what do you mean by that? What I mean is that if you take a look at what's happened since 08, 09, you find that banks are not loaning to small business. And therefore, they're making great profits, but the profits are on trading. And so if you want to fulfill your function as a bank, you have to supply capital to businesses that want to invest and hire people. And at the moment, uh, that's not happening. And nearly the degree that it has to occur. And my other point on this financial, the financial reform is the same thing on health care reform, same thing on energy. Um, the reality is that uh, I, I think that money has prevented things from happening. And during Dodd-Frank consideration, $318 million was contributed to uh, politicians in Washington by the, um, the financial industry. $145 million was contributed by the healthcare industry, 75 by the energy industry. So it shouldn't be any surprise that we have a watered-down financial reform. We didn't have a public option with health care, and we don't have an energy bill. So unless we're willing to do something about money and politics, we're not going to have a political process that addresses the real concerns of the American people. Are you prepared to name names, either banks or corporations or groups in the financial world uh, that you are referring to as those entities that are trying to suck the life out of the uh, declining world? Well, I think you ought to just check the record. What you need to do is just check the campaign contributions, and uh, I'm sure you'll find uh, most of them were involved. Some people might think that your book title suggests that President Obama hasn't fulfilled expectations. Can you share with us, maybe, uh, on domestic policy and foreign policy, how you would rate President Obama's job performance? No, what my book suggests is that the inspiration is uh, Lincoln's address to the Congress in uh, the second uh, year in office, where he says, we can only succeed by concert. That means by working together. It's not, can any of us imagine better, but can we all do better? And uh, that's the question that is relevant. Uh, all across the board. It's relevant to the inequality and fragility of our economy. It's relevant to, um, uh, you know, to the paralysis in our national dialogue. And we have to, it's also relevant to our own lives. Can we each do better? Can we be more selfless? Can we be more responsive to our neighbor? Can we be in better shape? Can we take care of our health better? Can we learn more? So it's relevant across the board. It's not just any one group or person. That's a good read, and I suggest everyone read it before they head to the voting uh, booths this November. Bill Bradley, the book is called We Can All Do Better, New York Times bestselling author. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you.